it's the next level. In the old time, the future seemed multifaceted. We had careers, families, personal aspirations, places to go, friends to see, bucket lists, the hum of human dreams we took for granted. But we were sleepwalking, just one step away from trading all those possible futures for the shared fate of the freeze. Welcome back to the show, panelers. I'm Steve. And I'm Daphne. And this is a spoilerful podcast of Snowpiercer Season 2, Episode 6, Many Miles from Snowpiercer. And our synopsis this week is very short and right to the point. Melanie fights for survival in treacherous conditions, being to do what others before her could not. You mean so. vying to do? Vying, being, I like being. <laughs> I think it's vying, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, I, it's, I've heard it both ways. So. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we do each and every week, Daphne, give us your initial thoughts as you watch this episode for the first time or both times or whatever. Your just initial thoughts. You know, when I started watching the episode, I thought, oh, okay, we're going to get to catch up with Melanie. It's probably not going to be a big episode. It's going to be one of those middle of the season episodes that shows us kind of what's been going on, but nothing big is going to happen. It'll probably mm. just be, you know, status quo. We'll learn a few things. I was wrong. This was the Melanie episode we've been waiting for. It gave us so much more than what I was expecting. Not only did we see how she made it to the station, we also got to see these flashbacks of what happened the day that Snowpiercer departed as well as some pieces connected to Melanie's betrayal of Wilford. Oh yeah, exactly. And I, I was so excited when I saw the, the title of this episode. I didn't think of it as a spoiler when I was doing the doc because I was like, oh, we finally get to him. see what's going on with Melanie. And um, I don't know why I just shouted like a little girl, but it was, <laughs> it was very exciting. And I, you know, it, at first I thought we were just going to get a bottle episode. It was just going to be Melanie all by herself in the station. But then, like you said, we get these flashbacks and we get a, deeper look into Wilford's character, but we also get his character from the perspective of others. Yes. Which I thought was really interesting. I didn't even put this in my notes is, is the Bennett, the, the stuff that Bennett says about Wilford. Yes. That we, we hadn't heard him say necessarily before this. So, so he, you know, he calls Wilford a monster and he says, we can't let him get a hold of this train. And so we, we find out that it's just as much Bennett, uh, as it was Melanie making sure that they stole that train from. And I think she even says that Javi had, didn't know anything about it. And it was two days before he even realized that Wilford wasn't on the train, that they had stolen the train. Well, considering how long the train is, mm -hmm. I mean, that's that's a feasible thing. I yeah. think that Javi wouldn't know. I thought, too, that we got to see this cruelness in Wilford from Melanie's perspective and also mm -hmm. from Ben's. And I'm, we have a lot to talk about in this episode, there's a Steve. Lot, there, <laughs> there's a lot to unpack and I've got stuff in my, in, in my top five about Wilford. So I'm sure we'll get to that. So uh, let's, let's do that. Let's launch into our top five discussion points and I will give it away to you first. Awesome. Well, first I wanted to bring up as my number five hallucinations. Whether it's because Melanie is just under so much duress or lack of food or both or the climate, I'm not sure, but she's having these hallucinations and she pictures or hallucinates Alex, Layton, and Wilford, starting mm -hmm. with Wilford. The cool thing I thought ab about these three is I feel like they're the three that have the most influence on her 
or the power over her. Because Wilford, despite the fact she left him behind, I feel like she still knows and feels that his dominance is a real threat to Snowpiercer and to the world. And I think that he still has a little bit of power despite the fact she pushes back. I don't mm -hmm. think he has the power over her that he has over Audrey, but I can see I, where it's similar. It's a different, yeah, it's a different kind of power. Yeah. Um, and with Leighton, it was more of a, you know, I can't think of the word that I there want. There was some playfulness. There yes. was some playfulness to her hallucinations with, with Leighton that I thought was really interesting that we hadn't seen that kind of interaction between them. And I think that's, and I, this, I'll, I'll go into this because this was one of my points, the, the hallucinations and uh, seeing the menace that Sean Bean is able to portray uh, in this. She, he's almost always smoking every time she yes. sees him. And I, I thought that was interesting. I didn't know if that's because he was smoking in almost all the flashbacks or or what. But, uh, you know, and, and then, like you said, so we have the menace of of Wilford. We have the kind of playfulness, I, I want to say, of Leighton. Because, you know, he's telling her about the cannibalism. And, oh, you get to see, you get to, to feel what we felt uh, in as the Tailies. And then we get the tenderness With of, Alex. of Alex. And I thought... That was so great because that was some of the things she was longing for yes. with her daughter that she never got. And so it was, it was really cool seeing uh, them talk the science and then the science and you almost forgot. I almost forgot it was a hallucination yeah. a couple times. Um, but the, especially that last, that last scene where Alex comes up behind her and is hugging her and Jennifer Connelly is just, is just betraying this, this desperation and frustration and loneliness and everything else I can, I can think of in, in this portrayal that I thought was just, uh, yeah, just outstanding. Uh, and it's too bad we're getting it in this, this kind of time frame. Uh, of, I mean, of the year, because this is typically when they bring out like the Golden Globe Awards, this is not a time frame they're going to be looking at because the Golden Globes just happened. Yes. You know? and, and so they had been postponed too. we're, we're mm -hmm. dealing with a really strange world yeah. right now where things are changing every day, but then they're also staying the same. So yeah. if that makes sense. So yeah, I feel like this was a great episode for Jennifer Connelly. And I think the, her hallucinations, I'm glad that she was hallucinating. Well, um, I'm glad she was hallucinating Leighton because the stuff with Alex and Wilford was, was serious, even though oh. it in two different ways, because with Wilford, it was this, he was taunting her like he was a ghost haunting her. Mm -hmm. With Alex, it was more this personal connection to the daughter that she didn't want to leave behind once, let alone twice. And all she wanted to do was get back to her. Yeah. And yeah, we well, had, yeah, there's more. There's more to the story. <laughs> and then even even well, and then like you said, we got the fun with Leighton, that whole high five thing where, yes. she, where she, she high fives him into the thin air. I laughed every time we, <laughs> we saw that in the episode, um, or every time I in the two times I watched it. Uh, so yeah, the the hallucinations were were great, and I thought it was a great way to bring those actors into it because we had such a small cast. I mean, only five names are listed in the credits. Yes. This, this week. And I've got them, I've got them down below um, who all was listed before as the, in the opening of the show. Um, but yeah, so that was, that was one of mine as well. So let's look at your number four or your next one. All right. So my number four and four and three on my list this week are tied together. Okay. They're both related to some of the flashbacks that we saw. Number four for me was seeing Melanie make this difficult decision. She's waiting for her daughter and her parents to arrive. They have not come yet. They've kept Wilford off the train with all of the folks that are trying to break in to get access to Snowpiercer. So he's left the train. 
Mm -hmm. And Bennett tells her, we can't let him have Snowpiercer. We can't let him back aboard because he's just so cruel. Mm -hmm. And so Melanie's, Melanie's face, Jennifer Connelly in that scene, pressing the button to start and move. You see Wilford is still there, but you see Jennifer Connelly's face and the tears are flowing and she knows mm -hmm. she's choosing to save the people on the train and leaving her family behind knowing she'll never see them again. And basically feeling like she is giving them a death sentence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And we get to see the, the portrayal of what we kind of heard talked about yes. earlier in the season when they, they talked, when she talked about how, how tough that decision was or that choice was, which, which was the way they said, I can't remember how, how they said it. One was a first time was a choice. Second time was a decision, something like that. Um, and I, I thought it was interesting too. You talk about that, the, this, that first, that flashback of her uh, leaving, you know, starting the train up and Throughout the episode, I didn't catch it until the second watch, but she's comparing herself to the woman at the station who left a daughter behind as well. Mm -hmm. And and even Wilford, there's a point where Wilford kind of taunts her about the fact that she's so similar to this woman who committed suicide because she left her daughter behind as well and her mission failed. And then you get to see that resolve in Jennifer Connelly when she says, but this mission isn't going to fail. Right. And I, I thought that was really, really great. Again, her her portrayal in this episode, the the, the motion she can show with just a, a look and just a, a, a sound, a whimper is is so incredible. She did such a good job. She really did. I feel like the casting, her in this role is magic. Yeah. And you know what? I feel for people who have not given this show a chance because they're missing out on some pretty special things. Yes, for sure. And that, that goes right into one of, one of my points, which is going back to the beginning of the episode, the monologue, and I've got a part of it down when we get to quotes that I really loved and, and I'll share that when we get down there, but to hear her talk about the hope and the belief that she has, that she's going to succeed, that this is all going to work out, that they're going to get back the earth is is really great and she just needs the time and she needs people other people to believe in her and then the, that second monologue she got when she was talking about the time before uh when we yes. see the city and we see her n not even on the train yet um it's just so good that the 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 contrast between those two monologues for me really hit me in this in the second watch when you see how bright the colors were before the snow came and she's like we took this for granted and we forgot about it and then we get the starkness of the snow and and the fact that the earth is coming back is going to find her pulse again i i thought that was great and i, I can't wait uh to watch this again just for those little moments i feel like when this season is over i'm just going to do a rewatch of the whole series again Mm -hmm. Because I know there's stuff that I missed and I really want to go back and now that we have this information and I still think we're going to get even more, mm -hmm. I think watching the first season again, knowing what we know, it's going to be different than the first watch through when you didn't know why Melanie was the way she was. Mm -hmm. And now I'm just, you know, I feel like we've gotten, we're picking away or peeling mm -hmm. away the onion. Yeah. And we're getting to dive in and learn more about her as a person, not just a leader. And I like that. I like we're seeing her as a human. Yeah. It's cool. There's exactly. just more to see. And I'm looking forward to seeing the rest of the season. I can't believe we're on episode six and there's only I four know. more. I know. Oh, and then we'll have to wait. Who knows how long we're going to have to wait for season three. I know. Uh, I feel like they have definitely lived up to what we saw in the first season. So I'm excited yes. to, to keep going on this yes. journey. <laughs> so let's talk about your next one. My next one is flashback. This part specifically 
showcasing how selfish and controlling Wilfred is. When he's fighting with Melanie over, do I need more jackboots or more geneticists? And Melanie is really fighting mm -hmm. to get the geneticists because she feels that they're going to be more helpful in the future. That order is not as important as the science needed to repopulate the earth and being able to to grow the world again once they're able to get out of the, the second ice age. Yeah. <laughs> and I feel like we just got a lot of insight into just how diabolical, entitled, I've already mentioned cruel, mm -hmm. he is. I mean, he's really a scoundrel, if you think about it. <laughs> I'm gonna, I, I'll take it one step further, even because if you if you look at the 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 final flashback we get of him ordering Gray to use all available force on the people that are trying to get on the on the on the train, and then ordering the jackboots to just kill those Genesis, the Genet, Genet, how do you say it? Genetic geneticists, G geneticists, um, and he didn't just kill. I mean, from what I could see, that was their families too. Yes, that was that was men, children, women, children. And that's straight up evil. Like we, we have not seen the evil. We've known that he's a menace. We've known that he's a bad guy. We've known that he's a manipulator. But in this episode, if that actually happened the way that flashback showed, that's evil. It's, like he's just dark, man. He's very dark and twisted and manipulative. And you're right. We saw the manipulation. We've seen signs of that already. What we hadn't seen was the pure evil smack in the face. It's like, if you didn't know from what we've shown you already that he was a bad guy, here, right. we're hitting you in the head with this. This is how bad he is. Exactly. He killed men, women, and children that yeah. were supposed to be on Snowpiercer. And he was more concerned with the night car. <laughs> he was so much more concerned with getting the night car built, which I understand his reasoning on, because mm -hmm. there needs to be some sort of entertainment. I mean, we're all like right now, as we deal with COVID-19, we're all trying to find different ways to entertain ourselves because we can't go out to the movies or go to a concert or do those things. Right. And I, you know how frustrating that is because mm -hmm. you want to be able to do something to just kind of relax or, or, you know, blow, ste blow off steam, whatever. Yeah. So you get that. However, yeah. he really wasn't focusing on repopulating the earth because frankly, I think that he doesn't want it to happen. No. Oh, absolutely not. I don't think he wants, he, he wants you know, his whole thing about order that he keeps talking, that he kept talking about in this episode was order, order, order above everything else, order mm -hmm. above getting the world back Yes, because he can control 10 miles worth of train. You know, he says 3000 people ten in, in a 10 mile uh, metal tube, you know, he we've got to control them and he wants to be the one in control. Yes. Yes, he does. It's, it's very clear. And not only was it clear from when he connected to Big Alice, we can see that it was clear way back in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And we're also learning that some of the people on that train were investors. Like he didn't do it all himself. They were investors. And I'm willing to bet someone like the Folgers were investors mm -hmm. in this train project of his. <laughs> For sure. For that sure. saved the world. I mean, it's saving. This is the next generation. This is families. This is, you know, the hope for the future. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And they haven't talked about it like they did in, in the movie or was it in the first season? They talked about it as an arc, you know, because the yeah. arc had to, at the heart, the arc had to at some point stop. Yes. To, to repopulate the world. And that's like we just said about Wilford. He doesn't want to do, he doesn't want the train to stop. Mm -mm. So. He doesn't want to hear that the storm or weather occurrence that created this ice age is changing mm -hmm. and that it's going to be relaxing and they're going to be able to move on and move off the train. And the thing is, no matter what dream world he wants to live in, 
whether Melanie gets that data there or not, if that is clearing out, he's going to have no choice but to have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So the next one that I have uh, is just the state of, of the station when Melanie when Melanie gets there and how she gets it back up and running. We we got it's a very quick uh, the first ten minutes of the show, uh, but I I really loved it, especially the second time through. You know, she finds the dead man outside of the station. I don't know if she knew who was there before she got there. I don't know if she just knew of the station or what her connection to it was. It seems like she didn't know these people. I don't think because... that she knew them, but I think she felt, I think it made her very sad and to see them. The, and she knew the station existed. Yes. And she knew they were close to it. So, mm -hmm. so all of that makes sense. You know, she finds the woman who committed suicide. She finds the body outside in the snow that's cut up. And then she finds the, the arm in the, in the refrigerator and she realizes how these, how this woman was surviving Yes. For, I think Wilford says five months. I don't know how in the hallucination, I don't know how she figured out uh, the five months, but uh, uh, all these things. And I, I loved how they kept showing us the repetitiveness of her coming out and uncovering the solar panels so that she could get the power going. And then she it almost like seemed like every day or every few days, she had to go out there and clear snow off those, those solar panels so that the, the, the station could keep going, you know, yeah. and but it was just great. That first 10 minutes is just her doing her thing. And I just, I, it was so brilliant. And that's where I thought we were just going to get this bottle episode, but of course yes. we, we get, we get more. <laughs> we got uh, so, so much more than I thought we were going to get. And it just lots of thoughts after I watched it. So I feel like we're, we're breaking it down. Yeah. <laughs> so what is your next one? My next one is Melanie's resolve. The mm. fact that she lost a sled, she lost her provisions, she didn't give up, she rationed her food, she continued to fight to get the station working, mm -hmm. she had to raise the tower by herself, and was working things out. And that's when we learned that number, you know, Balloon 11 had a problem because the tower fell over. Mm -hmm. Right. So that was, you know, that was the problem there. And, you know, she did this all herself. I mean, she even ate rats after she Ugh. discovered where they were. Yes. Yeah. So I had, I had, this was one of my points as well, or part of, part of what you just said was one of my points was the radio tower falling over. Cause we saw throughout the episode, we, we hear it teetering, we hear it kind of creaking. And, and so we, I kept expecting that it was going to fall over. And, and then when it did, it breaks that window and she has to get that can of stuff out that she sprays the window with. Um, and that ingenious way she figured out how to, how to get it back up you know, with, with, uh, building that, whatever that, however she did that contraption where she was able to turn the wheel and, and bring it back up. But I felt like we missed something because it shows her suit at 0%. It goes dark. And then she, she gets the tower all the way back up. She secures it. And like the next second she's inside, she's out of her suit and she's booting everything up again. And I'm like, uh, uh, did we miss something here? And the only thing I could figure is that they didn't want to repeat the beginning of the episode of her, you know, when her suit was starting to lose power and she was able to get into the station and, and power it back up. And they just figured it would be repetitive or something. But I felt, I felt like it was, there was a scene, there's something missing there that they, they could have showed at least her getting back into the station or, or something in the, so. Yeah, I feel like she almost collapsed outside in she, some yeah. way. Yeah, and then all of a sudden she was inside. So I don't know, maybe the mice all carried her in and took care of her. I mean, it isn't Cinderella, but... <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Could I mean, be. you just never know. I, I don't know. I think, I think you're right. Maybe they didn't want to take us down that road where she was rushing again to get inside so she wouldn't die because her suit ran out of electricity or air or yeah, whatever. Yeah, that's the only thing I could, that's the only thing I could think of is why they, they figured we didn't need to see that again, you know, yeah. but just cause like I said, it goes to zero, the light inside the thing goes out. So we can't even see her face anymore. And then the next second she's back and in, she's inside the station. 
Yeah. And I was just like, I, I feel like I missed something here. It's magic, so, Steve. It's magic. It's, they beamed her in. She just, there was a transporter. <laughs> she, and she... <laughs> she was brought inside. I don't know how it happened, but she made it in. And I guess, you know what? Maybe we, I guess we should just be happy that she did. Yes, um, absolutely. Because she was able to get things going. And it looked like she had all 12 balloons in the air. Mm -hmm. And she had run her data. And so she got everything ready. And she got onto the radio when it was time she kept checking the days you know crossing those mm -hmm. days off on the calendar like she was just tracking she knew what was you know she was on top of everything at that point she had been able to eat more even mm -hmm. though it's not what i would want to eat she was able to make it work no and judgment then, here nope <laughs> no so she was able to make that work and then you know it's funny that segues right into my number one which yes. is what we didn't see. Melanie, yeah. yeah, she can't raise him on the radio. She That's when she gets really upset and worried. Mm -hmm. Then she feels the vibrations and she goes, like she takes everything and goes and she sees the train doesn't slow down. Yeah. Although it looked like it was trying to. And I don't know if it was Alex trying to do something or or what, but at the last thing that she sees is Alex is at the back and she, Alex looks frantic. Yes, absolutely. This was in my notes, so go ahead. So now I'm just wondering, you know, what happened between what we saw in Snowpiercer when they couldn't get connected to Blue number 11. Right. And her return to Snowpiercer. So I feel like next week we're going to see what's going on because the last thing that we saw was they couldn't get connected to Balloon 11 mm -hmm. and they had killed the Breachman. Yeah. Yeah. So so we're going to hopefully next week, I guess we're going to find out what happened on Snowpiercer on the in-between time and maybe the last shot of, of next week's episode will be the same thing of Alex in the back of the... Uh, back of big Alice, you know, banging on the window. I really, I really hope that wasn't a hallucination, but I don't think it was. I don't uh, think I, so. Yeah. I don't think so. She, I think Alex has made peace with her mother. I think she mm -hmm. understands these things now, like why she's doing things. And this was a little bit different. And yeah. I just have a feeling something really bad has happened. And I'm scared for I'm, our people. <laughs> yeah, I'm scared for our people. I don't want anything to happen to them. And yeah, at this point, but there's there's a lot of there, I mean, there's not a lot of episodes, but we've got a few episodes left here, so so we can get this resolved and we can get Melanie back on the train. And <laughs> I know. So uh, it's yeah, I'm with you. The the mystery of where we're going from here is is gonna be. Uh, Great. These next four episodes are going to be uh, out. I hope. Anyway, I, I'm going to predict. I think they be will be. I think they will um, be because they haven't let us down yet. So my last, my last point is just about the rat the, that she sees, and it was. It, I thought it was ingenious. The trap that she that she uh, uh, figured out how to catch it, and then she, you know, she catches it, and she pulls it out, and Leighton's like, "Ooh, I got some recipes for for her." Oh, him. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, uh, but then she makes that die and she makes that die so quick. I couldn't figure out how she did it. I don't know where it came from, what she mixed together to make this die. Obviously it wasn't anything editable because she would have eaten it. Yes. Um, <laughs> I feel, so, I feel like, um, one of the, the liquid was alcohol, like isopropyl alcohol, I think. Okay. And I thought that the black stuff seemed it looked like car like some sort of carbon but i don't okay. i don't know like i didn't i wasn't able to find any information on it but that's what i think it could be okay. is i'm quite sure about the alcohol because i saw the bottle said isopropyl so i'm okay. assuming it was alcohol but the other part i'm not 100 yeah. sure 
Yeah. And then when she started tearing at that wall, I was like, no, don't. There's good rats are going to come out and cover you <laughs> up. But no. And no. she sticks her head in there and she finds the hot pocket. And all I could keep thinking was that line from Jurassic Park that life finds a way. <laughs> it does. Um, so I thought it you would appreciate it. It always does. <laughs> that that fact but but yeah it was it was really ingenious she finds this this warm pocket and then that was goes right into her one of her hallucinations with alex being able to talk science uh together and i thought that was was really really good yeah i really like that as well i feel like we got like i said we're seeing some of human of her humanity in this episode i feel mm -hmm. like last season we got to see how strong she is and this season we've been getting to see her softer side, her humanity, and how she really does care about other people, even yeah. at the risk of her own family. Like she, she lost her, her parents and could have lost her daughter because she was trying to save the world. And so, yeah, I'm dying for us to get back into, find out what happened in between because something big has happened and i'm worried for our people yes exactly uh so we both got a couple of notes here most of mine we've talked about uh i said i was going to list the credits it was jennifer Connolly, david diggs ito goldberg that's bennett and then rowan blanchard and sean bean those were the only five names we got at the very beginning of of the episode um and then I, I thought, and I didn't notice it the first time, but the second time I watched it, that was a really beautiful shot to me anyway. When they showed the balloon and you could see off in the background the, that green kind of glow that yes. I think was supposed to be like the Northern Lights yeah. or something. I thought that was a really, I know it's digital, but it's it still, it was a beautiful shot of, yes. of, of that and, and seeing kind of the length of the train from space and it was just a beautiful beautiful shot i thought yeah there was some great cinematography in this episode we got to see some cool stuff just even when they were zooming in over the city when melanie was giving her monologue like the way that it was shot was mm -hmm. just really cool and interesting yeah i'm enjoying like you said the cinematography this season yeah it's it's delivering i am not disappointed at all in anything that they've given us this season. It's been really well done. And we've just got four episodes left. I know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what, what, do you have anything else? Any other notes? Well, um, one thing, and it kind of ties to my, to my overall thoughts and my top five is whatever happened on the train during this time frame. It had to have been Wilford because he knows that he's got to keep Melanie off the train and keep mm -hmm. the data away because he can't lose control of things. It's all about control of the world, quote, the world, which right, right which now is, is yes, Snowpiercer. And the yeah. other thing that I wanted to point out is we got a brief look at Gray, R.I.P. Gray. We lost him last season. And we also saw Leighton getting on board the train too. I, I, I totally forgot it. I'm glad you brought that up because that is, that is kind of cool to see. And all that stuff of, we were seeing people getting on the train, people kind of hiding among the, the luggage. And, and so we got to see, which we only got a really brief glimpse of, I think in um, animation yeah. last season. So to actually see it kind of play out uh, live action was, was cool. Yeah, I wish they'd give us a little bit more, almost. Yeah. Like, I'd want to see how some of the others got onto the train, too. Not just Layton. And maybe I have to re-watch it, because maybe there were was more that I didn't see. But I feel like I didn't recognize anyone else who was getting on the train at that time. And it really shows us that the Tailies built a home in an area that was really just meant to be a luggage mm -hmm. container. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I, I didn't think about it until just now, but it almost resembles the way the people who are not Wilford have to live on Big Alice. Yes. Because they're in that same kind of confined spaces and stuff. So. Yeah, he keeps them well under control. Interesting. So we've got a few quotes here. Do you want to give your first one? Sure. Um, my first one is from Wilford and... It's basically pointing out Melanie's sentimental mm -hmm. streak. 
And so he says, you've acquired a sentimental streak, Melanie. You were a lot more useful when you were naive and ambitious. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah. And I can see where, you know, with what we got to see, Melanie was very ambitious, but I also feel like she was really focused on what was for the good of humanity when she was mm -hmm. working on things. And she didn't really go back to being um, super, like, care. I feel like we've seen her more caring lately. Mm -hmm. However, I think after she left her daughter behind, she kind of got very, like, stone-willed and, mm -hmm. and, you know, emotionless for such a long time. So yeah, I, I think we've kind of seen a little bit of this. And um, it's interesting. And so I've got that part of that monologue at the beginning. I think I've got it correctly. I was trying to type real quick as, as I was watching. I backed up a little bit a couple times, but it's Melanie talking. She said, this cold isn't something we can tame. We did this to our climate. Now, only the earth herself can restart her cold heart. I believe we can find her pulse again. And my biggest fear isn't dying out here. It's that the cold hearted among us will crush that hope before I can prove it. Oh, and you know who she's referring to. Mm -hmm. I got chills. I got chills just <laughs> reading that. I know. It was such a great monologue. It's probably one of my favorites now. Because I feel like it really represented what's happening. And we mm -hmm. so seldom hear from her in the yeah. monologue. And so, yeah, I definitely related to that when she yep. said it. And just you reading it again, too. It just, it's so poignant. I felt like we saw her heart. We saw yeah. Melanie's heart in this, in this episode. We saw yes. how she really truly is, is that she has hope. She has belief and, and she has a resolve to get it done. Yeah. And I feel like, again, it makes me want to go back and watch last season because now we have a better understanding of what happened and why she was so stern last season. Mm -hmm. It, it makes so much more sense. And uh, my second quote is, I think that if we are going to save humankind, we need people who actually know how to save humankind. <laughs> and this was Melanie in a flashback fighting with Wilford for her geneticist. Like I she loved was, that line. Ugh. I was so glad you put it in, in, in the doc because I said, that's a beautiful line. It is. And she fought so hard for them right up until the end. And you could tell when he had them killed, she was horrified. Yeah. Horrified. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so my, my last one is many miles from Snowpiercer, which is Melanie saying the title of the episode. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm, I have, I have picked up on this from other podcasters. I'm starting to key in on when people say, when people within the episode say the title of the episode, yeah. I'm starting to really key in on that. So. Yeah. Uh, yes. It happened on Walking Dead this week. Oh so. yeah, it did. <laughs> At the end. Yep. Yes, it did. <laughs> well, my final quote is was from Alex in Melanie's hallucination. And it was at the end when she, Alex is hugging her mother from behind. She's just kind of got her arms around her. And she said, you gave up everything for us, for the world. You don't have to be sorry anymore. Not to me, not to anyone. And I feel like that was Melanie coming to terms with what she did when she left Alex behind way back. I feel like that, it it's not just about this mission. It's about everything that Melanie has done, all of the decisions that she's made. Because let's face it, last season, she did some not so great things. She did. There were a few things like, like I'm forgetting the bad things she did because she's so good in this season. <laughs> I, know. You know, I know. But I know there were some things she did that kind of crossed the line in, in yeah, the, last, they did. the last season. Uh, Josie in particular. Yes. Uh, so I didn't see any feedback this week. Um, I'll, I'll make sure to send out a post again uh, and letting people know a deadline next week. But uh, um, I do have one pod or I have, I have actually two podcasts to recommend over the same show. Okay. And that is uh, TV podcast industries and 
This podcast, Panels to Pixels, are both covering WandaVision. And Derek and, and his friends, uh, they help me out so much with understanding what's going on. And Mark and Ben answer so many questions every week that I just, because I'm so confused on some of these <laughs> WandaVision episodes. Because I'm not you know, I'm not as deep into the comics as some people, as other people are. And I, I'm just, I know the movies and I know... That's about it. And I don't even really know the movies all that well. Uh, so <laughs> it's good to hear people who, who have insight into the deeper meanings of these things. So uh, again, TV podcast industries. And of course, you're already listening to Panels to Pixels. You're probably subscribed. You should be if you're not. Uh, I, you? I agree with needing a little assistance with understanding WandaVision. I think I know more than I used to because I have seen all the movies and I'm starting mm -hmm. to dig and do my own research, but I need uh, the podcast to help me fill in some of the blanks that I don't know. And so it's really good to be able to um, listen and get that insight from those two podcasts because it, like you said, it helps you break down things that you don't understand. Yes. And by the way, before I forget, I was emailing with Derek this week and he said, we sound real good together. So, Oh, <laughs> he that's lovely. Podcast, so that's great. I, Thank you, Derek. I told him I'd pass that on. To him, so, <laughs> to Thanks, you. Derek. I appreciate that. Um, Paik and I are actually podcasting with Derek soon to cover a movie for um, Run for Your Life. So I'm looking nice. forward to it. Uh, as far as podcasts I recommend this week, I have to recommend Adrenaline Cinema. Ben and Mark broke down The Rock, and I listened to it today while I was working. I and to listen to that. <laughs> oh, I laughed so hard. It's not a funny movie, but there are some funny moments, I guess. I can't yes. remember because I haven't seen it in such a long time, but... I take pleasure in gutting you, boy. <laughs> <laughs> it was so much fun to kind of revisit it, though, with the two of them, because honestly, it was... Base, it was just a lot of fun to listen to. Yeah. Um, and it makes me want to go watch the movie again so I can see all these things because I've forgotten. Um, yeah. It's just not one that I watch on a regular basis. But I had to listen to it because I just, I think the two of them together are really good and it's a lot of fun. So I definitely recommend that. And believe it or not, as Steve mentioned earlier, Walking Dead episode this week, we had an episode. Yes. So Walking Dead is back, so I have to recommend the Walking Dead cast. Lucy and Jason broke down the first episode, Home Sweet Home. Listen to that as well today. It was a lot of fun. I, even though I feel like I pay attention to every single thing in the episode, they almost always point out something that I missed. Absolutely. Absolutely agree. So I appreciate that. <laughs> So if you did want to submit your feedback to us, you can, you can go to our website, panels to pixels, podcast.com. That will redirect you to our Facebook page, which is facebook.com slash panels to pixels. And you can leave us a message there again, as I did this week, I will try to remember next week to put up a post thread for you to, uh, leave your comments. You can also send us an email at panels to pixels one at gmail.com. That's panels to pixels one, the T O spelled out right in the middle in the number one at gmail.com. Com. We also have a YouTube channel where you can subscribe. You can uh, give us a thumb. Is it thumbs up? No, it's not. Is it thumbs up? No, it's just like. It's, it's a, a like. And like. Yeah, thumbs up uh, on YouTube. And that is and that is Panels to Pixels podcast. So uh, uh, check us out there. Uh, next week, Daphne and I will be back uh, covering episode seven of. Is that right? Episode seven. It is episode seven. Yeah. Episode seven. We're getting getting so close to the I end. Know. That, uh, I'm scared. I'm excited, <laughs> but I'm scared because I don't want I don't want it to end, but I want yeah. to know what's going to happen. So yeah, it's, it's... like fifty percent excited, fifty percent scared, or seventy percent excited, or thirty percent scared. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's <laughs> it's hard because I just want to see what's going to happen, and yeah, but I don't want. I'm I really love the week to week because it just makes you appreciate and have something to look forward to Absolutely. every week. So, can you tell us what you're covering this week on Run For Your Lives with Paik? Oh, on Run For Your Lives this week, we are covering Kong Skull Island. You may have heard that Godzilla vs. Kong is coming out at the end of March, early April. 
So we are covering um, Kong Skull Island, and then we actually had Mark on to discuss a little Godzilla King of the Monsters on a, for a future episode. So nice. yeah, so so you've covered Godzilla, right? Mm -hmm. Godzilla was the one, uh, the 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 kaiju one that was actually set in Japan, right? That was the one with. Um, yeah, it started. Yeah. Yes, twenty fourteen. Right. Godzilla, I. The only way I can differentiate between them is Godzilla 98, Godzilla 2014. So the first uh, movie in the MonsterVerse is Godzilla 2014. Right. And then Kong Skull Island is second movie. And Even then, though it's set earlier yes. than, than Godzilla, right? It it's is. It's set in the 70s. Yes. And then Godzilla King of the Monsters, that has the kid from Godzilla grown up. Is that right? No. It, the, no, it's not. Okay. No, totally it actually confused. stars Millie Bobby Brown from oh, Stranger okay. Things. That's, that's the yeah. one. Okay. okay. There is, yeah, there are some tie-ins to both. Um, Dr. Sarazawa, who appeared in the 2014 movie, his character okay. and his sidekick, Dr. Graham, they're in this one. There are okay. a couple other subtle tie-ins, but um, for Kong Skull Island, there's... It's one of my favorite episodes that we've recorded so far. It was just a I lot can't of wait, fun. I can't wait to watch it again and send you a voicemail yeah. about Kong Skull Island because it's it is. A, I've watched it a couple times over the last few months, and uh, so I can't wait to watch it again to get a fresh uh, a fresh take on it. Okay, I remember Godzilla King of the Monsters. That's the one that started, and then it jumped like ten years. No, nope. right? That no, it started the very beginning starts with a, a disaster. Yes, that has a kid and a kid and his mom getting killed. Yes, that and, is Godzilla 2014. Oh, that's the 2014 yeah, Godzilla. That's okay, the first King of the Monsters. One. King of the Monsters is the one with Millie Bobby Brown. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. Yes. And yeah, All so right. Kong Skull Island will be out this week and okay. it was a lot of fun. So uh, I've probably just confused all the listeners even more, <laughs> So maybe Mark I can, apologize. Mark can fix that. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> Check out Run for Your Lives podcast with Daphne and Paik as they cover Kong Skull Island this week. Yes. <laughs> right. Well, thanks everyone for listening. I'm still Steve. And I'm Daphne. And this was Panels to Pixels. And we'll see you on the next video. Good night. Good night.